In this episode, we're going to find out what happens when the scourge Jim White comes calling on Sammy Holloway. She had just lost her mama and aunties banishing the queen and her briar stag, and now it looks like the whole East Tennessee Valley is coming apart at the seams. Here you are again, prepared to turn the page. You know the risk and know the danger. Let us begin. The soft orange glow of the lights cast a dim, eerie atmosphere on the study, bringing out the deep browns of the leather-bound books. I ran my fingers over the spines of the shelf Mama never let me poke around. The problems weren't ones I had any experience in dealing with, so I figured I needed to go look in somewhere that I didn't have any experience in either. The wind whined outside the lone window in the study, and the old oak tree scratched the panes, sending a tremor down my spine. Damn it, Sammy! Pull yourself together. You're a Holloway, not some meek girl who's scared of the dark. With a steadying breath, I resumed my search. A lot had happened in the three weeks since I rescued little John and lost Mama. It was almost as though the entire mountain knew Mama Holloway was gone, and all the sharp edges in the dark had come alive. Town folk from around Lonely had started disappearing, sometimes right out of their car stopped at an intersection in broad daylight. The police had scratched their heads for the first few days, but the officers of the town of Lonely knew when they were out of their depth. They went looking for an answer from the Holloway farm. They didn't expect to only find little John and me there, and I hadn't eased their concerns one bit. I was out of my depth, too. The first couple of monsters to show themselves were of some varieties I had the know-how to handle. Sage, circles, runes, and a lot of elbow grease put them back in their holes. I thought I was making progress, but what I failed to realize was that they weren't coming out into the light of day because they wanted to. They left their lairs because something much worse had chased them out. It wasn't until I spotted the omen bringer that I knew there was much worse coming. It was a crisp morning with red leaves swirling around the ground at the south edge of the farm. Some sense told me to look up from the poultice I was preparing, and that's where I spotted it. The bleached white beak skull regarded me from under a hood the color of starlight under a moonless sky. It reached up and a feathered quill materialized in front of its hand. With its other, the omen bringer lifted a heavy book. It wrote furiously for a moment and then, with a slight nod, it tore the page from the book and disappeared in the same eddy of fallen leaves. The poultice completely forgotten, I leaped off the porch and ran to the tree line where it had stood. There, on the ground, lay the page it had torn from its book. Unrecognizable signs and lettering covered its surface, and looking at them made my head swim and my ears ring. I held its omen, but had no way of unlocking its meaning. I took the page straight back into the study and locked it away in a wooden box protected with swirling designs of silver and jade interlaced. I needed to find out what it meant but I couldn't let anyone risk their sanity by trying to decipher the thing unprotected. That had been three days ago, and since that time, I hadn't trapped a single dark, shaggy thing plaguing the town. The police didn't like it, and they wanted me to just solve problems so that everything could go back to normal. Little John padded into the study, his feet making soft slipping noises on the rugs. He sat himself in the leather chair and tucked his knees up to his chest. What's wrong? He grumbled something under his breath and frowned at me. Can't sleep? No. The dirt is everywhere when I close my eyes. I moved over to stand in front of the chair he sat in and ruffled his hair. Stop it. He said, which made me just do it again. Quit it, Sammy. The dirt he was referring to was from a reoccurring nightmare he had been having every few days. When the briar stag had taken him, little John had said nothing about what had happened, but I had found him at the bottom of an open grave in the woods. The same grave us Holloway girls used to imprison the monstrous creature. That time, however, the queen had found a way to release it early, and we hadn't been ready. It had cost us Mama, Aunt Lindy, and Aunt Carol. The briar stack was gone. The queen was gone. John was safe, but our family was in tatters. The boogers and devils not leaving you alone? He looked down and shook his head and tucked his knees tighter to his chest, wrapping his arms around him. I knelt down in front of him and put a hand on his arm. We're going to find a way to get them back, okay? I promise. What if we can't, though? His voice was almost a whisper and streaked with worry. That's what I'm here for. 
You know how many books are in this old study? I doubt even Mama's read them all. There's got to be a way to bring them back in here somewhere, all right? John nodded, but still looked unconvinced. Here, how about you help since you can't sleep anyhow? That got a reaction. John immediately uncurled his small form and sat forward in the chair, his eyes wide and wild. The poor kid probably just wanted to have something he could help with. They were my family too, but he was the youngest and hadn't ever known the house without everyone there. I was old enough to remember when Aunt Agatha left. It absolutely shook me to the core, but I had Mama there to help me through it. Little John didn't have that. He lost his mother, and I was a poor substitute for comfort and normalcy, seeing as how I was a basket case myself. Okay, here's what I need you to do. We're looking for a book about the Omen Bringer, something about what it writes or how to translate its pages. John shot up and stood as straight as a steel beam with a two-finger scout salute. Together, we rifled through countless papers shoved in drawers, books so heavy they made the shelves sag, and scrolls shoved haphazardly in iron-bound trunks. At some point in the small hours, John had finally fallen asleep in a chair, a book lying open in his lap and another over his eyes. Slowly, the one in his lap slipped and fell onto the soft rug with a quiet thump. As it touched the rug, the dim lights fizzled and buzzed as a surge of energy overcame them. I didn't have a second to wonder what the surge meant before two hard raps came on the front door and a chill shot through me. Anyone calling at this hour at my door wouldn't be here for benign purposes. I was across the room with my ruined rod in hand, quick as a flash. The lights continued to buzz and flicker in dim golden halos. The sound came again. A pair of sharp raps of what sounded like a metal cane on the heavy wood of my front door. This time, however... A voice as sickly sweet as overgrown spring flowers called out. Yoo-hoo! Are you in there, little Miss Sammy? Old Jim Wyatt wants to have a quick word with you. The mention of his name turned my veins to ice. I didn't even dare breathe in in case he knew I was there. Oh, little Miss Sammy, I know you're in there somewhere. Don't try my patience, girl. I didn't have to wait for your little baby brother to go to sleep, but my cordiality will run dry. Mustering what little of my courage hadn't turned to water, I crept closer to the front door, my rod in my right hand, and my left sliding open the drawer of the hallway table as quietly as I could. Inside it, we kept a collection of tiny vials filled with small gray and white speckled rocks of potassium. We corked the vials with an airtight wax solution, but it would flash brightly and instantly catch fire if the vial broke and the metallic rocks inside met the fresh air. Making the things had taken the greater part of a month of hard work, supernatural extraction, and just as much instability and storage. If they helped protect little John and me not, then all that work would have been worth it. The entire property had been warded tight. I didn't know how he made it through them unimpeded. Great Grandmama Holloway warded the house itself before I had been born, and she built her workings to last longer than I'd be around. The seasons changed and time flickered past outside the walls, but in the Holloway farmhouse, nothing changed. And so the best witch of her century had wards that wouldn't permit anything unwelcome inside. I reminded myself of those facts, but even so, holding the vial gave me a little more reassurance. I've heard of you, Jim White. What do you want with the hallways? I asked through the heavy wood of the still-closed front door. It seems to me, Miss Sammy, that you are aware who I am, judging by that vial of some explosive substance you have in your little hand there. Jim White said through the door. I looked down at the vial and then back up at the thick wood. Yes, indeed, my dear child, I can see you despite the structure between us. Well, let us see isn't the right word. Your pulse pumping sweet red nectar through your organs paints such a picture in my mind as... <laughs> well, I'll just leave it at that. I wouldn't want to scare you too much, I'm just here to talk. You can stay right where you are and shout through this door just fine. I'd prefer to keep my sweet red nectar right where it is, if it's all the same to you. Say your peace and be on your merry little way. 
The confidence in my tone surprised me because I felt none of the bravado behind the words. Somehow it must have done the trick, or at least partially, because the undead monster pretended to be a smiling gentleman let out a frustrated growl. You are just as infuriating as your ancestors, you know that? I'm here trying to warn you, girl. <clears throat> now, he's opened the door where you can fend for yourself when the wraith wind comes. That made me pause. Everything that I have ever read or heard about that thing that was Jim White was that he'd kill you as soon as he looked at you. He was as selfish and self-servant as they came. I hadn't ever heard of him offering advice to anybody. But as much as that man terrified me, the thought of a wraith wind scared me more. What do you know of a wraith wind coming? Uh, this would go a lot smoother without a good door between us. I think there's a lot more to be said with you on the other side of something solid. We can talk through the stained piece of oak all you want, but it won't help you. What I have in my hands, my. What are you on about, Jim White? I asked, stepping up to the peephole and looking through it. He must have sensed me getting closer because he took something out of his pocket and held it up under the porch light. I took in a sharp breath. <sighs> ah, so I've come to the right place. He said, smiling with all his crooked teeth. You've got one too, I presume. It doesn't make any sense. Mine either, but the thing about the omens that thrice damn bird brings is they always split them up. That thing is telling us to work together. He didn't look pleased at the thought, but here he was at two in the morning, standing on my front porch. He didn't have any weapons in sight except a steel cane, but I knew he wouldn't need it to kill me. His left pant leg was covered in dried blood, and his shirt was torn at the sleeves. That blood yours? Would I be standing here before you if it was? No, girl, but they did get their licks in just the same. Now, will you please open the door? I pocketed the potassium vial, but kept my rod pointed forward as I cautiously unlocked the deadbolt. Then, even more carefully, I opened the door just a crack. Jim White smiled again. You promise to keep your bits to yourself? Not that it would hold any weight, but yes. I promise I will leave both you and little John in just the same condition you both are now. Satisfied? You aren't the best at inspiring confidence, I said, my tone dry and my rod pointed right under his nose. No, I assure you. I'm quite confident that little stick you've got there would sting. But it wouldn't save you should the mood strike me. You do have a lovely pair of lungs. Liver, too. I could use a new one. Mine came from an old man, and it's almost spent. I will kick you right off this property if you keep talking like that. I can figure the omen out on my own. Thank you very much. Frozen hells below, you are your mother's daughter. <laughs> I promise to behave myself. Now may I come in? Slowly, I lowered the rod and opened the door enough for him to step inside. More than half of me expected him to step in and immediately lunge at me. But Jim White, the undead scourge he was, did as he said and behaved himself. I led him into the kitchen. That was to say, about five feet past the front door. The omen and more importantly little John were in the study across the hall, but I had the good sense to shut the door as I left it before I knew just what kind of monster had come calling in the middle of the night. Jim could probably sense exactly where John was in the other room, but the door would give my little brother a fine chance to wake up and scramble out of the way if our meeting went poorly. As little sense as it made, I poured us two cups of old coffee. It was stone cold and thick with grounds, but the earthy liquid snapped me back into better focus. I didn't need to slip up from exhaustion, not around Jim White anyhow. The monster I stood with took the offered cup, but notably didn't drink from it. Instead, he pulled a piece of paper out of his coat pocket and placed it on the counter. Well, I've shown you mine. Now let's see yours. He said in a buttery voice. I glared at him for a moment, but then went to get the omen from the box I had hidden it in earlier. As I left, I never let him see my back, and I shut the door to the kitchen behind me. 
that door always had a loud creak in it whenever it moved and mama never let anyone fix it on account of wanting to know when the little ones tried to sneak into the kitchen at night for candies. Thank God for mama's concern for our teeth because I'd be able to hear it for sure if the monster I let in my home wanted to sneak around. John, I said, shaking my little brother in quiet desperation, trying to wake him up. He came to, all grogginess gone the instant he heard the stress in my voice. Come on, I need you to go upstairs right now. Go straight to your room and open the panel. Little John nodded gravely and he left without a word. The panel in question was, in fact, a false part of his bedroom wall with a pipe hidden behind it. We used it to listen in on conversations that weren't for children's ears from above when the adults thought we weren't listening. I hadn't used it in years. There hadn't been a need to since Mama started including me in more of the family business. But I was sure John still listened regularly enough. I quickly grabbed the omen paper from the protected box and returned to the kitchen. You sent the little one upstairs to be further away from me. That's such a wonderful sentiment. Irrelevant, but wonderful. I told you, I'm not here to find. I want to survive the wraith wind as much as the next beast. Do you have the omen? I handed him the paper. He placed it alongside his own on the counter. As the two came close together, the letters seemed to take on an eerie green glow, as though the ink were somehow luminescent. After a moment, the letters swarm over the paper and my vision narrowed. Shocked, I glanced in Jim's direction, but he didn't seem affected. The two pieces fused together and the green glow became blinding. Then, in a flash of inspiration, it all made sense. I blinked, realizing I was lying on the ground in the kitchen and Jim stood over me. I sat bolt upright and skittered away from him, but he had his hands up in a gesture of peace. What did you do? I demanded. Hush now. I didn't do anything to you, girl. You just sort of had an episode and fell to the ground convulsing. I just kept you from hurting yourself. The thought of Jim White putting his hands on me while I lay on the ground defenseless sent a shudder through me. I had seen his leftovers before and knew that in different circumstances, that could have been me. With the help of one of our old stools we used to peel potatoes, I stood up. I, uh, I tried to explain what I had seen and learned, but just the thought of putting words to it brought on a headache that felt like I was ramming a chisel into the front of my skull. The, the wind. I struggled to say the words through the pain, which even then was blinding me and making my head throb. It will take living vessels this time. The omen says we should be ready against the brambles and that black sap and vines will corrupt the essence of whatever they draw blood from. As I finished speaking, the pain subsided. I didn't know if it was the knowledge which had hurt me or the manner in which I had learned it. Mama had always said peeking into the future was a dangerous game. At worst, you wouldn't make anything out. And at best, you could get yourself killed from the foreknowledge. You did good, little witch. He was no longer smiling and looked grave. We don't have long. The black sap is a poison. We must gird ourselves against it. If we don't, there won't be anyone to defend this little valley from the creeping vines and delathorns. If the Wraithwind has chosen the land itself as its vessel this time, we need to salvage whatever we can. I've put too much of myself to the ground here just to up and run back to the old country. Wraithwinds were some of the most terrifying things about having some supernatural aptitude. They kicked up seemingly out of nowhere, but usually followed an upset in the power of a region. Mama and my aunts running off with the queen certainly qualified. When one kicked up, there were really only two things you could do, run and hide or replace the missing power. Neither Jim nor I could hold a candle on the queen, and if we hid, the wind would turn lonely into a ghost town. That was really why we called them wraith winds. They turned the places they formed into nothing but memories and wrought like a force of nature as defiant as a tornado or a blizzard. All that said, it really only left me with one thing to do. I had to find the queen and bring her back before the wind destroyed what we had left of my family. 
Well, Dark Valiance, that was quite the setup, and there's more coming. Yes, this year's Halloween special is a two-parter, and our team is already hard at work getting the next one ready for you. I would also like to remind you that the Mortis Maledictum novel is finally available. Get your copy now to follow along and read ahead. The link is down below. And when you pick up the book, we'd ask you to leave a review for the Defiling Gremlins on Amazon to help us grow our dark family and help spread the madness. Remember to like, subscribe, and follow the show on all your social media and podcast providers. Thank you.